This is the Classical Republican reading Isaiah Berlin's Two Concepts of Liberty, Part 8, The One and the Many. One belief more than any other is responsible for the slaughter of individuals on the altars of the great historical idea, ideals, justice or progress or the happiness of future generations or the sacred mission or emancipation of a nation or race or class or even liberty itself which demands the sacrifice of individuals for the freedom of society. This is the belief that somewhere in the past or in the future in divine revelation or in the mind of an entire of, of an individual thinker in the pronouncements of history or science or in the simple heart of an uncorrupted good man there is a final solution. This ancient faith rests on the conviction that all the positive values in which men have believed must in the end be compatible and perhaps even entail one another. Nature binds truth, happiness, and virtue together as by an indissoluble chain, said, on, said one of the best men who ever lived and spoke in similar terms of liberty, equality, and justice. But is this true? It is a commonplace that neither political equality nor efficient organization nor social justice is compatible with more than a modicum of individual liberty and certainly not with unrestricted laissez-faire that justice and generosity, public and private loyalties, the demands of genius and the claims of society can conflict violently with each other and it is no great way from that to the generalization that not all good things are compatible, still less all the ideals of mankind, but somewhere we shall be told, and in some way it must be possible for all these values to live together, for unless this is so, the universe is not a cosmos, not a harmony, unless this is so. Conflicts of values, conflicts of values may be an intrinsic, irremovable element to, in human life. To admit that the fulfillment of some of our ideals may in principle make the fulfillment of others impossible is to say that the notion of total human fulfillment is a formal contradiction, a metaphysical chimera. For every rationalist metaphysician from Plato to the last disciples of Hegel or Marx, this abandonment of the notion of a final harmony in which all riddles are solved, all contradictions reconciled, is a piece of crude empiricism, abdication before brute, f brute facts, intolerable bankruptcy of reason before things as they are, failure to explain and to justify, to reduce everything to a system which reason indignantly rejects. But if we are not armed with an a priori guarantee of the proposition that a total harmony of true values is somewhere to be found, perhaps in some ideal realm, the characteristics of which we can in our finite state. Not so much as conceive, we must fall back on the ordinary resources of empirical observation, ordinary human knowledge. And these certainly give us no warrant for supposing or even understanding that uh, what would be meant by saying that all good things or all bad things, for that matter, are reconcilable with each other. The world that we encounter in ordinary experience is one in which we are faced with choices between ends equally ultimate and claims equally absolute, the realization of some of which must inevitably, inevitably involve the sacrifice of others. Indeed, it is because this is their situation that men place such immense value upon the freedom to choose. For if they had assurance that in some perfect state, realizable by men on earth, no ends pursued by them would ever be in conflict, the necessity and agony of choice would disappear, and with it the central importance of the freedom to choose. Any method of bringing this final state nearer would then seem fully justified, no matter how much freedom were sacrificed to forward its advance. It is, I have no doubt, some such dogmatic certainty that has been responsible for this 
for the deep, serene, unshakable conviction in the minds of some of the most merciless tyrants and uh, persecutors in history that what they did was fully justified by its purpose. I do not say that the ideal of self-perfection, whether for individuals or nations or churches or classes, is to be condemned in itself, or that the language which was used in its defense was in all cases the result of a confused or fraudulent use of words, or of moral or intellectual uh, uh, perversity. Indeed, I have tried to show that it is the notion of freedom, in its positive sense, that is at the heart of the demands for a national or social self-direction, which animate the most powerful and morally just public movements of our time, and that not to recognize this is to misunderstand the most vital facts and ideas of our age. But equally, it seems to me that the belief that some single formula can in principle be found whereby all the diverse ends of men can be harmoniously realized is de demonstrably false. If, as I were, if, 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 as I believe, the ends of men are many, and not all of them are in principle compatible with each other, then the possibility of conflict and of tragedy can never wholly be eliminated from human life, either personal or social. The necessity of choosing between absolute claims is then an inescapable characteristic of human condition. The necessity of choosing between absolute claims is then an inescapable characteristic of the human condition. This gives its value to freedom, as Acton had con conceived of it, as an end in itself and not as a temporary need arising out of our confused notions and irrational and disordered lives, a predicament which a panacea could one day put right. I do not wish to say that individual freedom is, even in the most liberal societies, the sole or even the dominant criterion of social action. We compel children to be educated, and we forbid public executions. These are certainly curbs to freedom. We justify them on the ground that ignorance or a barbarian upbringing or cruel pleasures and excitements are worse for us than the amount of restraint needed to repress them. This judgment, in turn, depends on how we determine good and evil, that is to say, on our moral, religious, intellectual, economic, and aesthetic values, which are, in their turn, bound up with our conception of man and of the basic uh, demands of his nature. In other words, our solution of such problems is based on our vision, by which we are consciously or unconsciously guided, of what constitutes a fulfilled human life, as contrasted with Mill's cramped and warped, principle, or pinched and hidebound natures. To protest against the laws governing censorship or personal morals as intolerable infringements on personal liberty presupposes a belief that the activities which such laws forbid are fundamental needs of men as, as men in a good or indeed any society. To defend such laws is to hold that these needs are not essential or that they cannot be satisfied without sacrificing other values which come higher, satisfy deeper needs than individual freedom, determined by some standard that is not merely subjective, a standard for which some objective status, empirical or a priori, is claimed. The extent of a man's or a people's liberty to choose to live as they desire must be weighed against the claims of, of many other values, of which equality or justice or happiness or security or public order are perhaps the most obvious examples. For this reason, it cannot be unlimited. We are rightly reminded by R. H. Tawney that the liberty of the strong, whether, the, whether their strength is physical or economic, must be restrained. This maxim claims respect not as a consequence of some a priori rule, whereby the respect for the liberty of one man logically entails respect for the liberty of others like him, but simply because respect for the principles of justice or shame at gross inequality or treatment, or, or inequality of treatment is as basic in men as the desire for liberty, that we cannot have everything is a, nece is a necessary 
not a contingent truth. Burke's plea for the constant need to compensate, to reconcile, to balance. Mill's plea for novel experiments in living with their permanent possibility of error. The knowledge that it is not merely in practice, but in principle impossible to reach clear, clear-cut and certain answers. Even in an ideal world of wholly good and rational men and wholly clear ideas may madden those who seek for final solutions in single, all-embracing systems, guaranteed to be eternal. Nevertheless, it is a conclusion that cannot be escaped by those who, with Kant, have learnt the truth that out of the crooked timber of humanity no straight thing was ever made. There is little need to stress the fact that monism and faith in a single criterion has always proved a deep source of satisfaction both to the intellect and to the emotions. Whether the standard of judgment der derives from the vision of some future perfection, as in the minds of the philosophes in the 18th century and their technocratic successors in our own day, or is rooted in the past La Terra et le Mort, as maintained by German historicists or French theocrats or neoconservatives in English-speaking countries, it is bound, provided it is inflexible beyond, or inflexible enough, to encounter some unforeseen and unforeseeable human development, which it will not fit, and will then be used to justify the a priori barbarities of uh, Proc uh, Procrustes, the vivisection of actual societies into some fixed pattern dictated by our fallible standing of a largely imaginary past or a wholly imaginary future to preserve our absolute categories or ideals at the expense of human lives offends equally against the principles of science and of history. It is an attitude found in equal measure on the right and left wings in our days and is not reconcilable with the principles accepted by those who respect the facts. Pluralism, with the measure of negative liberty that it entails, seems to me a truer and more humane ideal than the goals of those who seek in the great disciplined authoritarian structures of the ideal of positive self-mastery of by classes or peoples or the whole of mankind. It is truer because it does at least recognize the fact that human goals are many, not all of them commensurable, and in perpetual rivalry with one another, to assume that all values can be graded on one scale, so that it is a mere matter of inspection to determine the highest seems to me to falsify our knowledge that men are free agents, to represent moral decision as an operation which a slide rule could in principle perform. To say that in some ultimate, all-reconciling, yet realizable synthesis, duty is interest or individual freedom is pure pure democracy or an authoritarian state is to throw a metaphysical blanket over either self-deceit or deliberate hypocrisy it is more humane because it does not as the system builds builders do deprive men in the name of some remote or incoherent ideal of much that they have found to be indispensable to their life as unpredictably self-transforming human beings. In the end, men choose between ultimate values. They choose as they do because their life and thought are determined by fundamental moral categories and concepts that are, at any rate, over large stretches of time and space, a part of their being and thought and sense of their own identity, part of what makes them human. It may be that the ideal of freedom to choose ends without claiming eternal validity for them, and the pluralism of values connected with this is only the late fruit of our declining capitalist civilization, an ideal which pr remote ages and primitive societies have not recognized, and one which posterity will regard with curiosity, even sympathy, but little comprehension. This may be so, but no skeptical conclusions seem to me to follow. Principles are not less sacred because their duration cannot be guaranteed. 
Indeed, the very desire for guarantees that our values are eternal and secure in some objective heaven is perhaps only a craving for the certainties of childhood or the absolute values of our primitive past. To realize the relative validity of one's convictions, said an admirable writer of our time, and yet stand for them in unflinchingly is what distinguishes a civilized man from a barbarian. To demand more than this is perhaps a deep and incurable metaphysical need, but to allow but to allow it to determine one's practice is a symptom of an equally deep and more dangerous moral and political immaturity.